Book Four, Chapter Four, Part Two of The Adventures of Gil Blas of Santillane by Alain Rene Lesage, translated by Tobias Smollett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter Four, Part Two of The Fatal Marriage, a Novel while siffredi's daughter was giving way to her grief the constable was hunting in his own mind for the causes which might render the nuptial office so contemptible a sinecure in his hands he could not be long in conjecturing that he had a rival but when he attempted to discover him he was lost in the labyrinth of his own ideas all he knew with certainty was the peculiar severity of his own fate he had already passed two-thirds of the night in this perplexity of thought when an undistinguishable noise grew gradually on his sense of hearing great was his surprise when a footstep seemed audibly to pace about the room he fancied himself mistaken for he recollected shutting the door himself after blanche's women had retired he drew back the curtain to satisfy his senses on the occasion of this extraordinary noise but the light in the chimney-corner had gone out and he soon heard a feeble and melancholy voice calling blanche with anxious and importunate repetitions then did the suggestions of his jealousy transport him into rage his insulted honour obliging him to rush from the bed to which he had so long aspired and either to prevent a meditated injury or take vengeance for its perpetration he caught up his sword and flew forward in the direction whence the voice seemed to proceed he felt a naked blade opposed to his own as he advanced his antagonist retired the pursuit became more eager the retreat more precipitate his search was vigilant and every corner of the room seemed to contain its object but that which he momentarily occupied the darkness however favoured the unknown invader and he was nowhere to be found the pursuer halted he listened but heard no sound it seemed like enchantment he made for the door under the idea that this was the outlet to the secret assassin of his honour yet the bolt was shot as fast as before unable to comprehend this strange occurrence he called those of his retinue who were most within reach of his voice as he opened the door for this purpose he placed himself so as to prevent all egress and stood upon his guard lest the devoted victim of his search should escape at his redoubled cries some servants ran with lights he laid hold of a taper and renewed his search in the chamber with his sword still drawn yet he found no one there nor any apparent sign of any person having been in the room he was not aware of any private door nor could he discover any practicable mode of escape yet for all this he could not shut his eyes against the nature and circumstances of his misfortune his thoughts were all thrown into inextricable confusion to ask any questions of blanche was in vain for she had too deep an interest in perplexing the truth to furnish any clue whatever to its discovery he therefore adopted the measure of unbosoming his griefs to leontio but previously sent away his attendants with the excuse that he thought he had heard some noise in the room but was mistaken his father-in-law having left his chamber in consequence of this strange disturbance met him and heard from his lips the particulars of this unaccountable adventure the narrative was accompanied with every indication of extreme agony produced by deep and tender feeling as well as by a sense of insulted honour sir freddy was surprised at the occurrence though it did not appear to him at all probable that was no reason for being easy about its reality the king's passion might accomplish anything and that idea alone justified the most cruel apprehensions but it could do no good to foster either the natural jealousy of his son-in-law or his particular suspicions arising out of circumstances 
he therefore endeavoured to persuade him with an air of confidence that this imaginary voice and airy sword opposed to his substantial one were and could possibly be but the gratuitous creations of a fancy under the influence of amorous distrust it was morally impossible that any person should have made his way into his daughter's chamber with regard to the melancholy so visible in his wife's deportment it might very naturally be attributed to precarious health and delicacy of constitution the honour of a husband need not be so tremblingly alive to all the qualms of maiden fear and inexperience change of condition in the case of a girl habituated to live almost without human society and abruptly consigned to the embraces of a man in whom love and previous acquaintance had not inspired confidence might innocently be the cause of these tears of these sighs and of this lively affliction so irksome to his feelings but it was to be considered that tenderness especially in the hearts of young ladies fortified by the pride of blood against the excesses of love-sick abandonment was only to be cherished into a flame by time and assiduity he therefore exhorted him to tranquillize his disturbed mind to be ardently officious in redoubling every instance of affection to create a soft and seducing interest in the sensibility of blanche in short he besought him earnestly to return to her apartment and laboured to persuade him that his distrust and confusion would only set her on an unconjugal and litigious defence of her insulted virtue the constable returned no answer to the arguments of his father-in-law whether because he began to think in good earnest that his senses were imposed on by the disorder of his mind or because he thought it more to the purpose to dissemble than to undertake ineffectually to convince the old man of an event so devoid of all likelihood he returned to his wife's chamber laid himself down by her side and endeavoured to obtain from sleep some relief from his extreme uneasiness blanche on her part the unhappy blanche was not a whit more at her ease her ears had been but too open to the same alarming sounds which had assailed her husband's peace nor could she construe into illusion an adventure of which she well knew the secret and the motives she was surprised that enriquez should attempt to find his way into her apartment after having pledged his faith so solemnly to the princess constance instead of feeding her soul with vanity or deriving any flattering omens from a proceeding fraught with personal tenderness but destructive to self-approbation she considered it as a new insult and her heart was only so much the more exasperated with resentment against the author while Sofredi's daughter with all her prejudices excited against the young king believed him the most guilty of men that unhappy prince more than ever ensnared by blanche was anxious for an interview to satisfy her mind on a subject which seemed to make so much against him for that purpose he would have visited belmont sooner but for a press of business too urgent to be neglected nor could he withdraw himself from the court before that night he was perfectly at home in all the turnings of a place where he had been brought up and therefore was at no loss to slip into the castle of Sofredi. nay he was still in possession of the key to a secret door communicating with the gardens by this inlet did he gain his former apartment and thence found his way into blanche's chamber only conceive what must have been the astonishment of that prince to find a man in possession and to feel a sword opposed to his guard he was just on the point of betraying all and of punishing the rebel on the very spot whose sacrilegious hand had dared to lift itself against the person of its lawful sovereign but then the delicacy due to the daughter of leontio held his indignation in check he retreated in the same direction as he had advanced and regained the palermo road in more distress and perplexity than ever getting home some little time before daybreak his apartment afforded him the most quiet retreat 
but his thoughts were all on the road back to belmont the resting-place of his affections a sense of honour in a word love with all its pretensions and surmises would never allow him to delay an explanation involving all the circumstances of so strange and melancholy an adventure as soon as it was daylight he gave out that he was going on a hunting expedition under cover of sporting his huntsmen and a chosen party of his courtiers penetrated into the forest of belmont under his direction the chase was followed for some time as a blind to his real design when he saw the whole party eagerly driving on and wholly engrossed by the sport he galloped off in a different direction and struck without any attendance into the road towards leontio's castle the various tracks of the forest were too well known to him to admit of his losing his way his impatience too would not allow him to take any thought of his horse so that the moment scarcely fitted faster than his expedition in leaving behind him the distance which separated him from the object of his love his very soul was on the rack for some plausible excuse to plead for a private interview with Sofredi's daughter when crossing a narrow path just at the park gate he observed two women sitting close by him in earnest conversation under the shelter of a tree it might well be supposed that these females belonged to the castle and even that probability was sufficient to rouse an interest in him but his emotion was heightened into a feeling beyond his reason to control for these ladies happened to look round on hearing the trot of a horse advancing in that direction when at once he recognized his dear blanche the fact was she had made her escape from the castle with nisa the person of all others among her women most in her confidence that she might at least have the satisfaction of weeping over her misfortunes without intrusion or restraint he flew and seemed rather to throw himself headlong than to fall at her feet but when he beheld in the expression of her countenance every mark of the deepest affliction his heart was softened lovely blanche said he do not let me entreat you give way to the emotions of your grief appearances i own must represent me as guilty in your eyes but when you shall be made acquainted with my project in your behalf what you consider as a crime will be transformed in your thoughts into a proof of my innocence and an evidence of my unparalleled affection these words calculated according to the views of enriquez to allay the grief of blanche served only to redouble her affliction fain would she have answered but her sobs stifled her utterance the prince thunderstruck at the death-like agitation of her frame addressed her thus what madam is there no possibility of tranquillizing your agitation by what sad mischance have i lost your confidence at the very moment when my crown and even my life are at stake in consequence of my resolution to hold myself engaged to you at this suggestion the daughter of leontio doing violence to her own feelings but thinking it necessary to explain herself said to him my liege your assurances are no longer admissible my destiny and yours are henceforward as far asunder as the poles ah blanche interrupted enriquez with impatience what cutting words are these too painful for my sense of hearing who dares step in between our loves who would venture to stand forward against the headlong rage of a king who would kindle all sicily into a conflagration rather than suffer you to be ravished from his long-cherished hopes all your power my liege great as it is replied the daughter of Sofredi in a tone of melancholy becomes inefficient against the obstacles in the way of our union i know not how to tell it you but i am married to the constable married to the constable exclaimed the prince starting back to some distance from her he could proceed no further in his discourse so completely was he thunderstruck at the intelligence 
overwhelmed by this unexpected blow he felt his strength forsake him his unconscious limbs laid themselves without his guidance against the trunk of a tree just behind him his countenance was pallid his whole frame in a tremor his mind bewildered and his spirits depressed with no sense of faculty at liberty but that of gazing and there every power of his soul was suspended on blanche he made her feel most poignantly how he himself was agonized by the fatal event she had announced the expression of countenance on her part was such as to show him that her emotions were not uncongenial with his own thus did these two distressed lovers for a time preserve a silence towards each other which portended something of terror in its calmness at length the prince recovering a little from his disorder by an effort of courage resumed the discourse and said to blanche with a sigh madam what have you done you have destroyed me and involved yourself in the same ruin by your credulity blanche was offended at the seeming reproaches of the king when the strongest grounds of complaint were apparently on her side what my lord answered she do you add dissimulation to infidelity would you have me reject the evidence of my own eyes and ears so as to believe you innocent in spite of their report no my lord i will own to you such an effort of abstraction is not in my power and yet madam replied the king these witnesses by whose testimony you have been so fully convinced are but impostors they have been in a conspiracy to betray you it is no less the fact that i am innocent and faithful than it is true that you are married to the constable what is it you say my lord replied she did i not overhear you confirming the pledge of your hand and heart to constance have you not bound yourself to the nobility of the realm and undertaken to comply with the will of the late king has not the princes received the homage of your new subjects as their queen and in quality of bride to prince enriquez were my eyes then fascinated tell me tell me rather traitor that blanche was weighed as dust in the balance of your heart when compared with the attractions of a throne without lowering yourself so far as to assume what you no longer feel and what perhaps you never felt own at once that the crown of sicily appeared a more tenable possession with constance than with the daughter of leontio you are in the right my lord my title to an illustrious throne and to the heart of a prince like you stands on an equally precarious footing it was vanity in the extreme to prefer a claim to either but you ought not to have drawn me on into error you well recollect what alarms were my portion at the very thought of losing you of which i had almost a supernatural foreboding why did you lull my apprehensions to sleep to what purpose was that delusive mockery i might else have accused fate rather than yourself and you would at least have retained an interest in my heart though unaccompanied by a hand which no other suitor could ever have obtained as we are now circumstanced your justification is out of season i am married to the constable to relieve me from the continuance of an interview which casts a shade over my purity hitherto unsullied permit me my lord without failing in due respect to withdraw from the presence of a prince to whose addresses i am no longer at liberty to listen with these words she darted away from enriquez in as hurried a step as the agitation of her spirits would allow stop madam exclaimed he drive not to despair a prince inclined to overturn a throne which you reproach him for having preferred to yourself rather than yield to the importunities of his new subjects that sacrifice is under present circumstances superfluous rejoined blanche the bond must be broken between the constable and me before any effect can be produced by these generous transports since i am not my own mistress little would it avail that sicily should be embroiled nor does it concern me to whom you give your hand if i have betrayed my own weakness and suffered my heart to be surprised at least shall i muster fortitude enough to suppress every soft emotion and prove to the new king of sicily that the wife of the constable is no longer the mistress of prince enriquez
while this conversation was passing they reached the park gate with a sudden spring she and nisa got within the walls as they took care to fasten the wicket after them the prince was left in a state of melancholy and stupefaction he could not recover from the stunning sensation occasioned by the intelligence of blanche's marriage unjust may i well call you exclaimed he you have buried all remembrance of our solemn engagement spite of my protestations and your own our fates are rent asunder the long-cherished hope of possessing those charms was an empty phantom ah cruel as you are how dearly have i purchased the distinction of compelling you to acknowledge the constancy of my love at that moment his rival's happiness heightened by the colouring of jealousy presented itself to his mind in all the horrors of that frantic passion so arbitrary was its sway over him for some moments that he was on the point of sacrificing the constable and even Siffredi to his blind vengeance reason however calmed by little and little the violence of his transports and yet the obvious impossibility of effacing from the mind of blanche her natural conviction of his infidelity reduced him to despair he flattered himself with weaning her from her prejudices could he but converse with her secure from interruption to attain this end it seemed the most feasible plan to get rid of the constable he therefore determined to have him arrested as a person suspected of treasonable designs in the then unsettled state of public affairs this commission was given to the captain of his guard who went immediately to belmont secured the person of his prisoner just as the evening was closing in and carried him to the castle of palermo this occurrence spread an alarm at belmont siffredi took his departure forthwith to offer his own responsibility to the king for the innocence of his son-in-law and to represent in their true colours the unpleasant consequences attending such arbitrary exertions of power the prince who had anticipated such a proceeding on the part of his minister and was determined at least to secure himself a free interview with blanche before the release of the constable had expressly forbidden any one to address him till the next day but leontio setting this prohibition at defiance contrived so well as to make his way into the king's chamber my liege said he with an air of humility tempered with firmness if it is allowable for a subject full of respect and loyalty to complain of his master i have to arraign you before the tribunal of your own conscience what crime has my son-in-law committed has your majesty sufficiently reflected what an everlasting reproach is entailed on my family are the consequences of an imprisonment calculated to disgust all the most important officers of the state with the service a matter of indifference i have undoubted information answered the king that the constable holds a criminal correspondence with the infant don pedro a criminal correspondence interrupted leontio with surprise ah my liege give no ear to the surmise your majesty is played upon treason never gained a footing in the family of siffredi it is sufficient security for the constable that he is my son-in-law to place him above all suspicion the constable is innocent but private motives have been the occasion of your arresting him since you speak to me so openly replied the king i will adopt the same sincerity with you you complain of the constable's imprisonment be it so and have i no reason to complain of your cruelty it is you barbarous siffredi who have wrested my tranquillity from me and reduced your sovereign by your officious cares to envy the lowliest of the human race for do not so far deceive yourself as to believe that i shall ever enter into your views my marriage with constance is quite out of the question what my liege interrupted leontio with an expression of horror is there any doubt about your marrying the princess after having flattered her with that hope in the face of your whole people if their wishes are disappointed replied the king take the credit to yourself wherefore did you reduce me to the necessity of giving them a promise my heart would not allow me to make good where was the occasion to fill up with the name of constance an instrument designed for the elevation of your own daughter you could not be a stranger to my design need you have completed your tyranny by devoting blanche to the arms of a man to whom she could not give her heart and what authority have you over mine to dispose of it in favour of a princess whom i detest have you forgotten that she is the daughter of that cruel matilda 
who trampling the rights of consanguinity and human nature under foot caused my father to breathe his last under all the rigors of a hard captivity and should i marry her no Sifredi, throw away that hope before the lurid torch of such an hymen kneel shall be kindled in your presence you shall behold all sicily in flames and the expiring embers quenched in blood do not my ears deceive me exclaimed leontio ah sovereign what a scene do you present me with who can hear such menaces without shuddering but i am too forward to take the alarm continued he in an altered voice you are in too close a union with your subjects to be the instrument of a catastrophe so melancholy you will not suffer passion to triumph over your reason virtues like yours shall never lose their lustre by the tarnish of human and ordinary weakness if i have given my daughter into the arms of the constable it was with the design my liege of securing to your majesty a powerful subject able by his own valour and the army under his command to maintain your party against that of the prince don pedro it appeared to me that by connecting him with my family in so close a bond yes yes this bond exclaimed prince enriquez this fatal bond has been my ruin unfeeling friend to aim a wound at my vital part what commission had you to take care of my interests at the expense of my affections why did you not leave me to support my pretensions by my own arm was there any question about my courage that i should be thought incompetent to reduce my rebellious subjects to their obedience means might have been found to punish the constable had he dared to have fallen off from his allegiance i am well aware of the difference between a lawful king and an arbitrary tyrant the happiness of our people is our first duty but are we on the other hand to be the slaves of our subjects from the moment when we are selected by heaven for our high office do we lose the common privilege of nature the birthright of the human race to dispose of our affections in whatsoever current they may flow well then if we are less our own masters than the lowest of the human race take back sir freddy that sovereign authority you affect to have secured to me by the wreck of my personal happiness you cannot but be acquainted my liege replied the minister that it was on your marriage with the princess the late king your uncle made the succession of the crown to depend and by what right rejoined enriquez did even he assume to himself so arbitrary a disposition was it on such unworthy terms that he succeeded his brother king charles how came you yourself to be so besotted as to allow of a stipulation so unjust for a high chancellor you are not too well versed in our laws and constitutions to cut the matter short though i have promised my hand to constance the engagement was not voluntary i do not therefore think myself bound to keep my word and if don pedro founds on my refusal any hope of succeeding to the throne without involving the nation in a bloody and destructive contest his error will be too soon visible the sword shall decide between us to whom the prize of empire may more worthily fall leontio could not venture to press him further and confined himself to supplicating on his knees for the liberty of his son-in-law that boon he obtained go said the king to him return to belmont the constable shall follow you thither without delay the minister departed and made the best of his way to belmont under the persuasion that his son-in-law would overtake him on the road in this he was mistaken enriquez was determined to visit blanche that night and with such views he deferred the enlargement of her husband till the next morning during this time the feelings of the constable were of the most agonizing nature his imprisonment had opened his eyes to the real cause of his misfortune he gave himself up to jealousy without restraint or remorse and belying the good faith which had hitherto rendered his character so valuable his thoughts were all bent on his revenge as he conjectured rightly that the king would not fail to reconnoitre blanche's apartment during the night it was his object to surprise them together he therefore besought the governor of the castle at palermo to allow of his absence from the prison on the assurance of his return before daybreak the governor who was devoted to his interests gave his permission so much the more easily as being already advertised that sir freddy had procured his liberty indeed he even went so far as to supply him with a horse for his journey to belmont the constable on his arrival there fastened his horse to a tree he then got into the park by a little gate of which he had the key and was lucky enough 
to slip into the castle without being recognized by any one on reaching his wife's apartment he concealed himself in the antechamber behind a screen placed as if expressly for his use his intention was to observe narrowly what was going forward and to present himself on a sudden in blanche's chamber at the sound of any footstep he should hear the first object he beheld was nisa taking leave of her mistress for the night and withdrawing to a closet where she slept siffredi's daughter who had been at no loss to fathom the meaning of her husband's imprisonment was fully convinced that he would not return to belmont that night although she had heard from her father of the king's assurance that the constable should set out immediately after him as little could she doubt but enriquez would avail himself of the interval to see and converse with her at his pleasure with this expectation she awaited the prince's arrival to reproach him for a line of conduct so pregnant with fatal consequences to herself as she had anticipated a very short time after nisa had retired the sliding panel opened and the king threw himself at the feet of his beloved madam said he condemn me not without a hearing it is true i have occasioned the constable's imprisonment but then consider that it was the only method left me for my justification attribute therefore that desperate stratagem to yourself alone why did you refuse to listen to my explanation this morning alas to-morrow your husband will be liberated and i shall no longer have an opportunity of addressing you hearken to me then for the last time if the loss of you has embittered the remainder of my days vouchsafe me at least the melancholy satisfaction of convincing you that i have not called down this misfortune on myself by my own inconstancy i did indeed confirm the pledge of my hand to constance but then it was unavoidable in the situation to which your father's policy had reduced us it was necessary to put this imposition on the princess for your interest and for my own to secure to you your crown and with it the hand and heart of your devoted lover i had flattered myself with the prospect of success measures were already taken to supersede that engagement but you have destroyed the bright illusions of my fancy and by disposing of yourself too precipitately have antedated an eternity of torment for two hearts whom a mutual and perfect love might have conducted to perpetual bliss he concluded this explanation with such evident marks of unfeigned agony that blanche was affected by his words she had no longer any hesitation about his innocence at first her joy was unbounded at the conviction but then again a sense of their cruel circumstances gained the ascendant over her mind ah my honoured lord said she to the prince after such a determination of our destinies you only inflict a new pang by informing me that you were not to blame what have i done wretched as i am my keen resentment has betrayed me into error i fancied myself cast off and in the moment of my anger accepted the hand of the constable whose addresses my father promoted but the crime is all my own though the woes are mutual alas in the very conjuncture when i accused you of deceiving me it was by my own act too credulously impassioned as i was that the ties were broken which i had sworn for ever to make indissoluble take your revenge my lord in your turn indulge your hatred against the ungrateful blanche forget what and is it in my power then madam interrupted enriquez with a dejected air how is it possible to tear a passion from my heart which even your injustice had not the power of extinguishing yet it becomes necessary for you to make that effort my liege replied the daughter of siffredi with a deep sigh and shall you be equal to that effort yourself replied the king i am not confident with myself for my success answered she but i shall spare no pains in the attainment of my object ah unfeeling fair one said the prince you will easily banish enriquez from your remembrance since you can contemplate such a purpose so steadfastly whither then does your imagination lead said blanche in a more decisive tone do you flatter yourself that i can permit the continuance of your tender assiduities no my lord banish that hope for ever from your thoughts if i was not born for royalty neither has heaven formed me to be degraded by illicit addresses 
my husband like yourself my liege is allied to the noble house of anjou though the call of duty were less peremptory in opposing an insurmountable obstacle to your insidious proposals a sense of pride would hinder me from admitting them i conjure you to withdraw we must meet no more what a barbarous sentence exclaimed the king ah blanche is it possible that you should treat me with so much severity is it not enough then to weigh me down that the constable should be in possession of your charms and yet you would cut me off from the bare sight of you the only comfort which remains to me for that very reason avoid my presence answered Sofredi's daughter not without some tears of tenderness the contemplation of what we have dearly loved is no longer a blessing when we have lost all hope of the possession adieu my lord shun my very image you owe that exertion to your own honour and to my good name i claim it also for my own peace of mind for to deal sincerely though my virtue should be steady enough to combat with the suggestions of my heart the very remembrance of your affection stirs up so cruel a conflict that it is almost too much for my frail nature to support the shock her utterance of these words was attended with so energetic an action as to overset the light placed on a table behind her and its fall left the room in darkness blanche picked it up she then opened the door of the antechamber and went to nisa's closet who was not yet gone to bed for the purpose of lighting it again she was now returning after having accomplished her errand the king who was waiting for her impatiently no sooner saw her approach than he resumed his ardent plea with her to allow of his attentions at the prince's voice the constable rushed impetuously sword in hand into the room almost at the same moment with his bride advancing up to enriquez with all the indignation which his fury kindled within him this is too much tyrant cried he flatter not yourself that i am cowardly enough to bear with this affront which you have offered to my honour i traitor answered the king standing on his guard lay aside the vain imagination of being able to compass your purpose with impunity with these mutual taunts they entered on a conflict too violent to be long undecided the constable fearing lest Sofredi and his attendant should be roused too soon by the piercing shrieks of blanche and should interpose between him and his revenge took no care of himself his frenzy robbed him of all skill he fenced so heedlessly as to run headlong on his adversary's sword the weapon entered his body up to the hilt he fell and the king instantaneously checked his hand the daughter of leontio touched at her husband's condition and rising superior to her natural repugnance threw herself on the ground and was anxious to afford him every assistance but that ill-fated bridegroom was too deeply prejudiced against her to allow himself to be softened by the evidences she gave of her sorrow and her pity death whose hand he felt upon him could not stifle the transports of his jealousy in these his last moments no image presented itself to his mind but his rival's success so insufferable was that idea to him that collecting together the little strength he had left he raised his sword which he still grasped convulsively and plunged it deep in blanche's bosom die said he as he inflicted the fatal wound die faithless bride since the ties of wedlock were not strong enough to preserve to me the vow which you had sworn upon the altar and as for you enriquez pursued he triumph not too loudly on your destinies you are prevented from taking advantage of my froward fortune and i die content scarcely did these words quiver on his lips when he breathed his last his countenance overcast as it was with the shades of death had still something in it of fierceness and of terror that of blanche presented a quite different aspect the wound she had received was mortal she fell on the scarcely breathing body of her husband and the blood of the innocent victim flowed in the same stream with that of her murderer who had executed his cruel purpose so suddenly that the king could not prevent it from taking effect 
this ill-fated prince uttered a cry at the sight of blanche as she fell pierced deeper than herself by the stab which deprived her of life he did his utmost to afford the same relief to her as she had offered though at so fatal an expense to one who might have rewarded her better but she addressed him in these words while the last breath quivered on her lips my lord your assiduities are fruitless i am the victim merciless fate demands me and i resign myself to death may the anger of heaven be appeased by the sacrifice and the prosperity of your reign be confirmed as she was with difficulty uttering these last words leontio drawn thither by the reverberation of her shrieks came into the room and thunderstruck at the dreadful scene before him remained fixed to the spot where he stood blanche without noticing his presence went on addressing herself to the king farewell prince said she cherish my memory with the tenderness it deserves my affection and my misfortunes entitle me at least to that harbour no aversion to my father he is innocent be a comfort to his remaining days assuage his grief acknowledge his fidelity above all convince him of my spotless virtue with this i charge you before every other consideration farewell my dear enriquez i am dying receive my last sigh here her words were intercepted by the approach of death for some time the king maintained a sullen silence at length he said to Sofredi, whose senses seemed to be locked up in a mortal trance behold leontio feed on the contemplation of your own work in this tragical event you may ruminate on the issue of your officious cares and your overweening zeal for my service the old man returned no answer so deeply was he penetrated by his affliction but wherefore dwell on the description of circumstances when the powers of language must sink under the weight of such a catastrophe suffice it to say that they mutually poured forth their sorrows in the most affecting terms as soon as their grief allowed them to give vent to its effusions in speech through the whole course of his life the king cherished a tender recollection of his mistress he could not bring himself to marry constance the infant don pedro combined with that princess and by their joint efforts an obstinate attempt was made to carry the will of roger into execution but they were compelled in the end to give way to prince enriquez who gained the ascendancy over all his enemies as for Sofredi, the melancholy he contracted from having been the cause of destruction to his dearest friends gave him a disgust to the world and made a longer abode in his native country insupportable he turned his back on sicily for ever and coming over into spain with portia his surviving daughter purchased this mansion he lived here nearly fifteen years after the death of blanche and had the consolation before his own death of establishing portia in the world she married don jerome de silva and i am the only issue of that marriage such pursued the widow of don pedro de pinares is the story of my family a faithful recital of the melancholy events represented in that picture which was painted by order of my grandfather leontio as a record to his posterity of the fatal adventure i have related End of Book 4, Chapter 4, Part 2